it's a pleasure to be here. I was here a year ago giving a talk to the board. And the title of my talk then was, Why is everything you've heard about China wrong? That's, <laughs> okay. I'm talking, taking a broader view. I have a book that the Oxford University Press will be coming out by the end of this year. You're still debating what the title will be. And that's why it's so cumbersome, because it might be cracking the China conundrum. It might be China, the abnormal economic power. Whatever it is, there's something different about China. And most, and much of what you read, actually, in my book, I say it's wrong. Whether it's about politics, the economy, uh, opinions of the Chinese, opinions, opinions in the West, my book takes the economist approach and tries to argue that somehow analytically is wrong, and the policies related to it then tend to be wrong. I mean, that's a relatively technical subject, and I'm going to give you a much broader coverage today. And, but some of the themes or some of the viewpoints that I have in my book will come through here. So you're going to hear a little bit about China from a perspective that's not the normal way that people describe China. And I think you'll probably find it refreshing and, and, and different. Let's start off by asking the question, where does China want to be 30 years from now? 2049 is the, is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. So China set out a grand long-term vision. It wants to be a developed economy by 2049. It wants to have a modern industrial state. It wants to have a military power which is on par with the United States. It's launching several major initiatives to improve its connectivity to Europe, the One Belt, One Road initiative, the old Silk Routes. If it's successful, China wants to restore the concept that it is the Middle Kingdom, that it can look both east and west. That's what it aspires to be in the future. And let's take a brief look at where is China today. Here is China. Its goal, its objectives are essentially based upon the desire to achieve rapid, sustainable growth. How successful has it been? The two decades from 1991 to 2010, along the horizontal axis, China grew at more than 10% a year. There's nobody, no country comes even close. Its growth is declining. The articles talk about real problems. So let's take a look at the four years since 2010, post-global financial crisis period. Here's China. Only a handful of countries, even the last four years, have grown faster than China's 75 to 8%, and these tend to be fragile economies. By any standard, China is different. Its growth record over three decades is pretty impressive. Yet, the views of China are increasingly turning negative. Let's now go back. Let's go back 30 years when Deng Xiaoping decided to open up China to the outside world. What he inherited from Mao was a very poor country, very balanced, desperate to strengthen its relationship to the outside world. So Deng Xiaoping is seen as the reformer, the person who opened up China. What kind of a reformer was him? Was he? Now, I've labeled him in my book the unbalanced reformer. Unbalanced because he concentrated development along the coast. And what did he do? He established incentive free trade regimes, first along Guangdong, Fujian province, then Shanghai, and then all along the East Coast 20, 30 years ago. So they had special privileges. He reshaped the budget. So 60, 70% of government resources concentrated only among these three to four provinces and no longer equally across all the provinces. And then over time, free trade zones showed up along the entire coastal areas, along the borders with Russia, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, along the Yangtze River. Special tax privileges, duty-free privileges, special lower interest rates, with only one objective, growth and export. Now in the West, when we give special benefits, we tend to give it to the backward areas, the areas which are lagging. 
He took the opposite approach. I will give it to the areas which I think have potential. And they tended historically to be further advanced. So concentrate incentives along the coast, concentrate budget resources along the coast, tell everybody else they have to wait, and spend it on infrastructure. So this is an example of a highway system. Go back to Deng Xiaoping's time, and the color shows you the intensity of the road network. What is, in, is incredible in China, it's all the same color. Aside from Beijing and the island of Hainan, the road system in China was equal. Everybody got the same access to modern roads. Frankly speaking, whether or not economically it made sense or didn't make sense. Unbalanced growth concentrated on the coast, Beijing, Tianjin, and then you expand inwards. So over 20 years, China builds up a modern highway system. It spends as much as 10% of GDP on highways and transport. And now it's building up the high-speed rail network. Infrastructure, largely concentrated in, along the coast and then spread inland. So money, incentives, infrastructure, concentrated. The people follow. Migration of workers from the interior, from the central provinces, largely concentrated along the coast. How many? 270 million migrant workers, primarily along the major coastal cities. So if you go to Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, 40 to 45% of the labor force are migrant workers. So what differentiates migrant workers? They don't have what we call formal residency permits. That means they can't buy housing. They can't drive a car. They can't apply for many formal jobs. Their children cannot go to local primary schools, so they leave their families back home. That's 270 million. In the beginning, their salaries are half of that of formal Chinese. Today, it's very much the same. So you have labor, resources, incentives, all concentrated on the coast. And what happens? China becomes specialized. Its industries relocate. All the export modern industries along the coast. Nothing in the interior. The raw materials, other industries more evenly distributed, but the export-oriented industries only along the coast. Now, we've never seen a country which reoriented its productive structure along such geographic lines in terms of concentration. That's why I call Deng Xiaoping the unbalanced reformer. What was the impact of this kind of concentration on GDP growth rates? The red line is the national growth rate average. The blue, the coast. Central, far west. So you start off, 1981, everybody's growing at the same rate, 3 to 4% a year. Balanced growth under Deng Xiaoping regionally. Low growth nationally. And then the blue line, the coast starts to take off, growing much faster. You, you have a collapse here, Tiananmen incident. Then you have the rebound again. By here, the coastal provinces are growing at 16% a year. What is happening to the rest of the country? It's beginning to follow. It's beginning to narrow. Over the last five to six years, the interior regions begin to grow faster than the coast. Rural areas begin to grow faster than urban areas, although for two decades, urban areas grew faster than rural, and the coastal areas grew faster than the interior. We've never seen this before. A situation where you concentrate on one part of the country, but then over decades, the rest of the country catches up and actually exceeds that part of the country. Unbalanced growth in this particular framework can actually lead to geographically balanced outcomes if you have a long enough time frame. In most other countries, democratic societies, you can never do this. You could never vote to say, I will concentrate my resources only in London. The rest of the, uh, of the UK can follow. But this is what Mao did. 
He didn't have to worry about being elected. He just go ahead and did this. So you have this big debate in China. Unbalanced growth geographically or balanced growth. How much should you deal with inequalities? When should you deal with inequalities? It is still a big issue. And that's one dominant theme of the China experience. The other unbalanced theme in terms of the China uh, topic is what we call consumption. If you pick up major financial newsletters or even the, the major uh, public presses, they will all say China's growth model is unbalanced. And what do they mean by unbalanced? By that, they mean that consumption as a share of GDP falling dramatically. It's only 35% of GDP. Investment as a share of GDP is 45%. This is the most extreme of any country in the world. So here in England, United States, consumption is 60 to 70% of GDP. In China, it's 35. In the West, we invest maybe 15% of GDP. In China, they invest 45%. This is extreme. So what do people recommend? China needs to rebalance. Growth needs to be more consumption oriented. The sense is that consumption is being repressed in China. But is it being repressed in China? This is the growth rate of consumption per household or per individual, the red line. It's been growing at 10% a year for three decades. 10% real growth of consumption. Multiples higher than any other country grouping. Multiples higher. But just think about it. The recommendation is China needs to consume more. How can it consume more when it's already consuming at a rate? Multiples higher than any other country in the world for three decades. The reality is growth of consumption in China is actually going to decline as GDP growth declines. So all that discussion about China needs to be rebalancing, you have to promote consumption, doesn't make sense because it's actually consuming more than any other country. So in my book, I explain this. Why is it that the share of consumption of GDP falls dramatically to the lowest in the world, yet growth of consumption per person or household is increasing at the highest rate in the world? And actually, economics tells us why. In fact, if you want living standards to improve, your growth rate needs to be unbalanced. But economically and socially, everyone thinks that in balanced growth is better when unbalanced growth is actually the solution. Now, let's very quickly talk about what is happening today. Today, you have what I call a real divergence in terms of opinions between the pessimists and the optimists in terms of the future growth rate of China. I put myself here as likely. I'm usually th thought of as an optimist. I think of myself as a realist. But anybody who's a realist is probably an optimist. So let's talk about pessimists. The pessimists think that GDP growth in China could fall very rapidly to 3 to 4% in the next couple of years. It may even become negative. They see a, a financial crisis coming. The optimists, what's in the 13th five-year plan, they see growth continuing at something like 65 to 7 for perhaps another decade or more. And what I see is that with some reforms, some successes, China could grow at maybe six, six and a half to the rest of this decade, and then it will moderate. So a decade from now, it might be growing at 5%. So is 5% a bad outcome? 5% 10 years from now, China's GDP will be twice as large as it is here today. An economy that size growing at 5% is unheard of. 5% is therefore a very ambitious target, not a negative target, even though people talk about a decline of 4 to 5% as being bad. So what will it be? 3 to 4% very soon, or a financial collapse, or something like 5, 6, 7% for another decade. Why do the pessimists see a collapse coming? Now, these pessimists can be observers who I would call alarmists. They've been saying that China's going to crash tomorrow, and they've been saying that for 20 years. And they'll continue to say for 20 years. But it also includes very reputable people. Larry Summers, Secretary of Treasury, pre former president of Harvard. He came out with an article two years ago. China's growth is going to decline sharply to 3 to 4% within a few years. 
It's abnormal to grow at 6%, 7%, 8%. You'll find, therefore, very reputable people predicting a real sharp decline in China's growth rate. Now, if you predict a very sharp decline in China's growth rate, it's usually based upon a potential debt crisis, a financial collapse, or a property bubble. So in my book, I get into a chapter on the debt issue. I get into a chapter on the property bubble. And I talk about the alarmist view. And in my book, I actually say these are good things, not bad things. So why do I think it's actually a good thing, but everyone else thinks it's a bad thing? Let's spend a few minutes on this. Let's look at the debt problem. Does China have a debt problem? Now, economists measure it in terms of the size of the debt in relation to the size of the economy. And that's the horizontal axis. And China's debt to GDP ratio today is 250%. So even today, when I pick up the Times or the Telegraph, I see articles which say China's debt ratio has surged to 250%. It's got a major problem. But if you look at the diagram, 250% is right in the middle. It's actually the exact same debt to GDP ratio as the United States. So why is it that this is a, a really a, a major economic or financial vulnerability when it is not for the United States or many other countries? The other thing which is very different about China, its debt to GDP ratio higher than most developing countries, which are these blank circles, and it is lower than most developed countries, which are these dark squares. So higher than most developing, lower than most developed. I think that's just about right. China's not really a developing economy. It's not really a developed economy. If I had a guess, I would put it right in the middle. And it is right in the middle. Yet everyone writes that it's a disaster. Now, why do they think it's a disaster? Because if you look at the growth rate of debt to GDP over the last seven, eight, nine years, China's growth rate, the vertical axis, is higher than every country except Ireland. And all countries where the debt to GDP ratio increases so rapidly in such a short time, they've all collapsed. So the argument then is, why not China? If every country collapses, what makes China different? And the answer is very simple. There is something very different about China's debt. Primarily is China's debt is state-driven debt. It's state banks lending primarily to state-owned enterprises and to local governments. In all the other debt crises that we talk about, it's private debt, private banks lending to private companies triggers a chain effect. The dynamics of a state-driven debt situation is just quite different. And there's all sorts of reasons why it won't lead to a crisis, yet everyone writes about the fact that it will be. So just yesterday, Fitch, major rating agency, talks about the surge in corporate debt and predicts a crisis and the growth will fall 2% very, very soon. Corporate debt, that's what worries people. Because most of that credit is flowing to corporates. And China's corporate debt as a share of total debt, the other two components being government debt, household debt, corporate debt is really high. And why is corporate debt very high? Primarily because so much of this goes to the state enterprises. And what are people investing in in China? What is most of this going to? And the answer is, exceptionally concentrated 